Hey guys, Indy Game here, and in this video we're uh, just um, building the Starship. So you can tell I'm not like the previous ones which I made in older videos, well, obviously. No, this instead is basically the Moonlander Starship. Sorry, uh, but unfortunately my recording glitched out for the earlier uh, section, so most of the construction of the actual Starship is gone, but anyway. This is the moon lander which won a contract from NASA a couple of years ago and it was the only one that won the contract because all the others like Blue Origin or Jeff Bezos which is Jeff Bezos' company were all too expensive and so NASA just said right we're not using those and so yeah this is the um, moon lander which is it's pretty self explanatory and got the Starship Super Heavy Booster. This is a simplified version, I just want to make it clear to everyone because uh, it's just faster, but trust me, it's a story for another time, but I will make one that is um, basically use the full system, so it goes up into orbit, that docking port on the top you saw me put there is so it can dock up in orbit with another Starship, refuel a uh, crew comes up in the Artemis rocket by NASA and then they go to the moon and land with this thing which is really ri ridiculously gigantic and the booster it was a lot better than the one I made last time I changed myself to make the grid fins properly and I succeeded so instead of just having four the thing is they aren't spaced out like basically evenly they're the grid fins, so it was a bit kind of difficult to get that working. I had to resize them several times through try and error, but anyway, you can just see me testing them here and uh, building the engines and the fairing for them on the first stage. Of course, I was saying better design than the first one I tried to build and make it all silver. And I will in the future try and do the chopstick system as it's known, which catches Starship. But anyway, yeah, landing legs. And yeah, the chops catch it when it lands the booster, and they would have on the first flight. But anyway, uh, let's be thin to spell for a couple of seconds. And lift off so the starship there with its booster. As you can see here, it's a bit more wobbly. Did I forgot to auto strut it the first time, which you're currently not watching because. I didn't want to show that because I didn't go very well. As I just explained, it um, went very awry, but. or awry. Because I didn't auto strat it and it shook itself to bits, which. not good for rockets. But yeah, so. the boost is launching, and as you can see, the uh, grid fins aren't evenly spaced apart. But yeah, we're going to separate in a second. I had to take a more vertical approach, because I was at risk of basically. The booster separated it to a lower altitude, and I do fire the engines as you can see here for a bit. Now we have a problem. We have to turn around the booster. But yeah, it wasn't too difficult. But I'm just burning the first stage. We just fire the engines. I just activated navigation in the KSC, and it's quite helpful. It shows you where it is, so you can see. And this is how it lands in real life. And also, like for example, the Falcon 9 booster often does this. Sometimes the Falcon 9 booster lands on a, um, basically a barge, but sometimes, like on the first successful landing, it landed uh, on land at the Kennedy Space Center back at it. You can do a boost back burn where they do precisely what you're watching happen right now. Uh, got to save there, you know, where something goes bad. And we've got to kill our velocity, just kill it, and. I cut out most of these because they were long and boring, whatever, but there were a lot of uh, failures with this, but yeah, and I've cut out most of it. One time I got to land, but the well, the upper stage wasn't able to, I wasn't able to recover the upper stage, uh, which was not a very good thing, but yep, yeah, here's my f successful landing attempt. It's a bit out. Fast. It wasn't as hard as it looked there though. There's the footage is sped up by a decent amount. But you know, 
I'm shocked the landing gear did survive that because this thing, even when I'm fuel, weighs like 60 tons. I'm just waiting for loading here. And basically, I just got it to burn like this until it started going up on its apoapsis. And then when that happened, I knew everything was fine and we were going to make it to orbit. Like, see, we're going up right now in the footage and now we're in orbit. The next thing I needed to do was set up a maneuver node to go to the MUN. Uh, it was a bit funky. And also, I had tr some trouble opening the maneuver node editor. But, yeah, there we go. I'm just going to make it correct. And, yeah, I tabbed for a bunch of different planets to get to the lander before really realizing I could just press the forward slash button. So I did the. But. Yeah, but you just click there and then it'll turn you what you see next maneuver. It's quite a handy feature for KSP. And yeah, this is our transmooner, the, the MUN, not the moon in KSP, the analog. Um and it's the transmooner injection and it's pretty self explanatory. It takes you to the MUN, it gives you a trajectory that flies you past it and then you slow down and land. Which you'll see in a second. I may have cut out though while recording this of me talking the basically the lunar or moonar orbital insertion, but it was just very boring, so I just decided to skip to the landing after I'm done with this burn here. I mean most of this video is just focusing on focusing on it after it's landed and yeah. So just going to lower our apoapsis, I almost loaded too much. And yeah, sorry about that everyone, but I just had to cut this to when we're about to land. I also noticed the view inside was a bit weird, but I couldn't fix that, so you know. I noticed the Earth was almost blocking out the sun, so a bit I time warped. Till it was a lunar eclipse where basically the moon is been completely blocked inside the Earth's Umbrush section of its shadow, but anyway, we're about to land here, and there we go. And that actually is why the moon sometimes is red, as soon as it's blocked out, the atmosphere scatters blue wavelengths more. Yes, yeah, the lunar eclipse, blue wavelengths more inside the atmosphere, which causes the atmosphere to appear blue, but all the red um, waves just go back into space, hit the moon in a lunar eclipse, bouncing off the atmosphere, and then come back to hit our eyes. But all the blue light is in the atmosphere, that's what I just explained, that's why the atmosphere is blue. Um, uh, that's basically why the moon can appear like a blood moon, or red moon, or whatever people call it nowadays, superstitious people. Well, not just that, I don't know why I said superstitious there. Also, time moved for a bit. I just wanted to make sure that apparently in the game it is tidally locked, the man is, where one side always faces the planet, like the moon in real life, where it orbits at the same speed that it rotates, but I wasn't entirely sure. I think I time warped for too much, but yeah, I can confirm it is now. And we're just going to finish it and launch up. Oh, I, I, I love quick saving. Also, unfortunately, I couldn't go on EVA. The hatches are obstructed. Of course, in my next video, I'll fix that. But uh, enough of that. Let's launch in a second. But just now, we'll fix that in the next video. Shall we go a lot more in-depth into this? And we're off. We'll just to check those landing legs. And now we're going completely vertical. I didn't want to put it into orbit. On the real thing, they will to dock with the Artemis and Orion capsule. Get yeah, back to Earth, but on this they won't, because as I said, that's a story for another time. A story, a demonstration, I guess you could say, for another time. I'm just burning here to escape the Mun's sphere of influence, and just wait. There you go. And the next thing to do was create a maneuver node that will lower my periapsis. To not deep inside, but just inside the atmosphere of Kerbin, which is 70 kilometers high, even though you only really begin to experience it at about 55 unless you're traveling really fast. But about, well, sorry, 60 kilometers. Below 60 kilometers, you'll pretty easily feel it. 
the re-entry, but sometimes when you're traveling really fast, like once I did a mission with the Outer Planets, which I currently have installed to Sarnas, the analog of Saturn, the re when I came back I was moving at 8,000 meters per second, I forgot to turn the capsule around, and it entered the atmosphere at, well, 8,000 meters per second, and, like, immediately, it re when it was about 67,000 meters, it just got destroyed by the heat of re-entry, and I had to do some fixes. And, yeah, we're just waiting. Now we're going to point vertically or radially out relative to the planet. I'm just playing with the camera effects here, where, where you're basically... His face was pointing perpendicular in the direction of the ground. I'm doing that here. I'm also doing a rolling maneuver. A bit like in the Apollo spacecraft where they did passive thermal control, PTC. To help even out the temperature. So it doesn't burn. This is not the most stable thing. I don't know because it's actually sometimes used for stability. Such as on the uh, Perseverance and Curiosity rovers. The launch vehicles use that to stabilize themselves. This is an error break though, where I don't land or just completely stop. Yep, but what happens instead is you just slow down. It is really useful error breaks are though, for when you're low on fuel. But, uh, and also gives you more control of your land site, but the problem is they do take forever. I'm just performing a barbecue roll. Nice so we that run and uh barbecue roll to help keep the spacecraft stable. And yeah, I had a bit of fun with the camera there. You can see how quickly it's moving as that camera is stationary. Relative to the craft of course, because it's the Kerbin spinning around the sun, but stationary relative to the craft, which is what matters. And so it shows you how quickly it's moving around Kerbin in its upper atmosphere. And we just had to do another air break after this, one more, and then that's, and then we I just stopped. Well, I did, I was, I realized the next one wasn't going to be an air, well, it was going to be an air break and it wasn't going to be basically landing, so I just fired the engines up, and as you can see here, it lowered my periapsis to inside Kerbin, so that I wouldn't have to do another air break, as I'm talking about, they take forever and I have enough fuel. I just flew this landing gear for no reason there, didn't, uh, I just, no reason at all. Um, it's still speeding up at this altitude. See it's going red hot, the plasma is, from the force of re-entry and the friction. I was a bit concerned about landing in those lakes, but it was fine, I flew beyond it. Bit of time warping. This was more difficult than you might think. I did have a lot of test runs doing this because the thing has landing legs, but it also is not landing on smooth terrain. So what do you expect? Just had to really slow down there. But uh, yeah, this is kind of cool how this will be the moon lander. But we also had some technical difficulties there. It fell upside down and I immediately knew the game was over, so... Just close that, and then waiting, and then just carefully. I really had to get the SAS nodes to turn timed correctly because if I didn't, it would tip over. And there we go. So yeah, thank you guys for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please consider dropping a like down below. And yeah. Thank you for watching everyone, I'll see you in the next video, and as always, good night.